or my second presentation on the Our Father. <clears throat> I have chosen to concentrate <clears throat> on an attitude which I think is very important and inspired by the Lord's Prayer, and that is wonder and awe. I begin by asking myself the question, one, when is the last time that we sensed wonder and awe at anything? Perhaps it was recently. Perhaps not in a long time. I suspect that our, your experience is very much like that of many others, including myself. We live in a world of the commonplace, the practical, the utilitarian. If it is not useful, we throw it away. If it is not practical, we ignore it. This materialistic approach is diametrically opposed to a sense of wonder and awe in our lives. I would like to pursue this topic of wonder and awe because retrieving it is so important to our prayer. In the Lord's Prayer, when we speak the words, our Father who art in heaven, we immediately position God. We should not think of this in terms of a physical place or remoteness. Our Lord teaches us to address God in heaven, not to emphasize distance, but to convey a sense of presence. Heaven is, after all, where we wish to be in the end, and from heaven all is seen by God. Isn't a father proximate to us, near to us, part of us? And then he adds, who art in heaven, because we wish to be where the Father is. The world in which we live is not heaven. In expressing the yearning of the human spirit, the faithful Christian expresses the deep desire to be with the Father. Heaven is our home. We are pilgrims. However, hasn't God become man? We have the incarnation, after all. Hasn't the eternal word become flesh and descended to earth? Isn't God present to us now through his incarnate word? Heaven touches earth now in a foretaste that we call the sacraments and in which we adore here in the Eucharist. At the time described in the Gospels, Jesus walked the earth. This wonder and awe at God's presence is possible at any time. But we find it expressed so frequently in the Gospels that it really is difficult to count each episode or passage. I cite only one passage, one that you no doubt know very well. It comes from St. Mark chapter five. A woman afflicted with hemorrhages for 12 years. Quite poignantly, the woman thinks to herself, if I but touch his clothes, I shall be cured. What faith this woman has. 
What yearning for the power of God in her life. And her desire is rewarded. She is cured. And Jesus says, daughter, your faith has saved you. Go in peace and be cured of your affliction. This is wonder and awe. How marvelous must this cure have seemed to the poor woman. Wonder and awe is one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, you may recall from your catechism. Wisdom, understanding, counsel, fortitude, knowledge, piety, and fear of the Lord. Often it is spoken of as fear of the Lord because this fear is a holy fear, a reverential fear. The kind of fear that we find in Matthew chapter 8 with the centurion who will not allow Jesus to enter his house. So filled with awe and wonder he is at Jesus' presence. Or John chapter 4, the account of the Samaritan woman whose life has been revealed to her. Or Elizabeth, overwhelmed by a visit of the mother of God that even John the Baptist leaps in her womb, recorded in the Gospel of St. Luke chapter 1. These passages and so many others should move us deeply. They speak to us of the wonder and awe that we should experience in God's presence. The Father in heaven whose name is hallowed. Wonder? You might be asking yourself, what's the difference between wonder and awe? Wonder is what we cannot explain or appreciate fully. Awe is what leaves us agape, marveling at something which is sublime. Permit me a little digression, because wonder and awe comes to us in different ways. It brings me back to my childhood. My parents brought me to Mass as a child at one of two places. One was the chapel of the university, the Catholic chaplaincy at the university campus. It was only a block away from our house. And our parish church, which was the cathedral. Both filled me with wonder and awe as a child. At the university chapel, there was an inscription from the Gospel of St. John that lined the upper wall and culminated in these words over the arch, over the altar. Ego sum via veritas et vita. I am the way, the truth, and the life. John chapter 14, verse 6. That inscription was in Latin, which helped kept capture my attention. That the inscription lined the arch above the space in which the holy sacrifice of the Mass was celebrated filled me with wonder and awe. At the cathedral, the nave was higher than anything I had ever seen in any other building, kind of like here at St. Mark's. And five large stained glass windows rose above the sanctuary. The center window depicted the crucifixion at the moment when Jesus turns to St. John and says, Behold your mother. John chapter 19, verse 27. 
the height of the window, its central location, the variations in shading and intensity that a rising or setting sun brought to the glass was nothing less than mystical. Wonder and awe. Again, it could only inspire this wonder and awe in the believer. The experience of wonder and awe about which I am speaking goes beyond considerations of architecture and artistic expression. Those things are vehicles, instruments to bring us to wonder and awe. Not all of us are blessed to be surrounded by beauty in our prayer. When I speak of wonder and awe, I am referring to an attitude, an attitude of mind that when brought to prayer, seizes our attention, impresses us with reality, and heightens our consciousness, and opens our lips, minds, and hearts to converse with God who loves us. Hallowed be your name. It is certainly informed by faith, for faith brings us to prayer. However, as we know all too well, distractions can occur and repetition can diminish our zeal. Moments of prayer that we have set aside during the day can become routine, and routine and the acedia it fosters are counterproductive. The problem, you see, my friends, the problem is not the timing of our prayer or our desire to be faithful to a set time of the day for prayer. These are not the problems, although they're important. The problem is rather the absence of wonder and awe, a fear of the Lord, a profound realization that God is present. If we acknowledged wonder and awe in our prayer, then the time set aside for prayer would present no problem. Let me use an analogy, one that all of us should be able to relate to in one way or another. Remember your grandmother. Consider a visit to your grandmother. These regular, sometimes daily visits begin when you're a child. Your first encounter with your grandmother arouses curiosity as a child. She belongs to another world, and yet she's very much a part of your own. Her language, preferences, and manners are anything but modern and up-to-date in your view, but she instills reverence, she commands respect, and she loves you. All the while, your visits become routine. Off to grandmother's house we go. And after the niceties of affectionate greetings have passed, you continue on with your childlike games and pastimes. There comes a time, however, when the age and the passage of time, you experience the wisdom and insight of your grandmother. She breaks through your adolescent self-absorption. It is at this moment that you realize grandmother has something to say to you. The respect shown her up until this moment was mostly a formality. Now it becomes her right. 
and you come to understand that she deserves your reverence and attention. This, my dear friends, is wonder and awe. Wonder and awe has set in. Grandmother's maternal dignity requires more than respect. She, we engage with her. And all of this is part of love. But we are slow to absorb love's subtleties. Love is a subtle thing, as you know. And very often, we are slow to absorb it. Therefore, we sometimes do not learn love's lessons. The turning point is the moment at which we are struck by the intimate presence of this person with whom, until now, we had only a formal and routine relationship. The experience of wonder and awe only expands with the passing of time developing into frank and open conversation, the exchange of ideas, and the learning of life's lessons. This is a metaphor for what happens in prayer. The sacred scriptures are filled with such encounters, filled with them. They are simply variations on a theme of wonder and awe. I think, for example, I'll mention a few of them, of the meeting of Jesus with the Samaritan woman at the well in John 4. The woman, as you know, is simply performing a routine task. But Jesus seizes her attention when he asks her for a drink of water. Jews and Samaritans had nothing to do with each other. This captures her attention. The rest of the episode unfolds like the journey we encounter in the life of prayer. The turning point, I believe, is the moment when after Jesus has revealed an extraordinary knowledge of her marital life, you remember the passage? Go and get your husband. I have no husband, she says. Oh, in fact, you have had five husbands, and the man you're living with now isn't your husband. Such brutal honesty must have shattered whatever pretense the woman had. The Samaritan woman then expresses a certain wonder and awe by saying, Sir, I can see that you are a prophet. But this isn't the end of the meeting, but only the beginning, which unfolds to climax in a profession of faith in Jesus as the Messiah. She says, this is truly the savior of the world. When one comes to this moment in prayer, where we drop everything and marvel at him whom we are encountering, then the wonder and awe has found its mark. We have hit the bullseye, we might say. We joyfully sense that this treasured moment is only the beginning of something greater. I fear that in attempting to describe this experience of wonder and awe, I have fallen short of conveying its power and potential. However, fear of the Lord, or a sense of wonder and awe, finds its origin in the Holy Spirit. These gifts of the Holy Spirit accompany the movement of God's grace in the sacraments in which we participate, especially in the Eucharist, but also in our confirmation. As baptized and confirmed, we have in us a glorious potential made possible by the work and power of the Holy Spirit. This is what the power of the Holy Spirit means. 
it instills a wonder and awe in us. If God is the origin of our interior life, as I said yesterday, quoting Tanqueray, then great things remain to be accomplished to those open to the Holy Spirit. Wonder and awe awakens. Sometimes it's mediated by something else. For example, beauty can alert us to the presence of God. Beauty, however, is not God. Beauty is God's gift to us. Beauty is the way God catches our attention. There is also in beauty something of objective truth, contrary to the relativism that makes us think that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Beauty has within itself the power to awaken an affirmation that leads to God, not away from him. Beauty can move us to fall on our knees and overwhelm us with a sense of God's presence. This is the joyful moment of affirmation. This is our yes to God. This is hallowed be thy name. Just today, I received an email from a priest in my diocese who's the chaplain to the university. He had gone, conducted a retreat for the university uh, students. They had about, oh, I don't know, 150 who attended the retreat. And uh, after the retreat, a non-Catholic student who, for whatever reason, was attending, came up to him and said, you can sign me up for RCIA. The priest asked him, well, what brings this about? He said, I could not help but be attracted to the reverence shown for the Eucharist, and that impressed me. Wonder and awe. Wonder and awe. How does St. Paul express it? 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18 and following. As God is faithful, our word to you is not yes and no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who has proclaimed to you by us, Silvanus and Timothy, and me, was not yes and no, but yes, has been in him. For however many are the promises of God, their yes is in him. Therefore, the amen from us also goes through him to God for glory. Perhaps yes is what wonder and awe are, an affirmation of the good a yes to the truth, a yes to the acceptance of the way, the truth, and the life. That old inscription that I saw over the altar of my childhood. Only then does every word from his mouth have power to enliven everything from our heart. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, may our prayer radiate the wonder and awe that you instill in us through your spirit, through confirmation. May it bring us closer in relationship to you who loves us and dwells within us. May our response always be yes to your movements of grace. We ask all this through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.